Father, bless us as we preach the word of the Lord today. In Jesus' name, amen. Fighting the right fight the right way. You know, many times today the church is involved in fighting the wrong fights, the wrong way. We many times major and minors, and we minor in majors major things. I think we've witnessed just a few days for the last week or so what happens when the military and generals and people in positions of authority fight the wrong fight. While our generals are fighting to promote wokeness in the military, while they're assessing the greatest threat and danger to our military and to our nation is racism. So we've got to fight to get rid of the racists. They took their eyes off of Al-Qaeda. The Taliban as they were gobbling Afghanistan. The president was asked, do you think that uh, Afghanistan will fall just in June or July of this, month, of this year? He said, no. It fell so fast that nobody was even ready. Why? Because we're distracted looking at the wrong things, not paying attention to things that ought to be. You saw what happened last uh, summer. Y'all won't like me today, but in many cases, we were marching all over the country, shutting down shopping centers, uh, destroying shopping centers, raiding businesses, um, shutting down freeways, marching all over the country, chanting the name George Floyd. My comments is not about George Floyd. My comments about us. But you'd be hard pressed to find any of us who will march or even just come down and visit a clinic with thousands of babies over which the overwhelming, of which the overwhelming majority are black. Just as black as you and me are slaughtered every day. All of that marching about one man, but not a whimper about thousands that are slaughtered every day. Every day. One of our riders the other day, I won't mention the city that he said that he was in because I don't want to indict anybody. But he was in one of our major cities where we have bishops and pastors and superintendents to spare. Pastors, bishops, Auxiliary bishops, I mean, we got all the positions. And he said, while there on business, I visited a clinic and said, there stood one white man. And I went there and I marched and I stood with him. And said, for the time that I was there, he was there on business. He said, no one else came. And I thought about all of the church leaders that I know personally. Good people in that city. But they have no interest in fighting this right battle the right way. 
We've stood idly by and allowed marriage to be redefined. The family is being redefined. Um, we are defining deviancy down. I've been talking to you about that. Things that we used to call deviant and we used to be somewhat shocked and alarmed about now it's treated as normal. I told you the other day that the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which was considered to be horrible, was four men killing seven gangsters on Valentine's Day. That's a light weekend in Chicago now. That's almost a light weekend in some of these neighboring counties. And even here. We've defined deviancy down. Are you praying for me? Satan is coming against us. And I'm here today to sound the alarm and say to the church that we are going to have to fight. Amen. Um, forget uh, t uh, adopting the strategy that you can just go stand off in a corner and I'll stand off in a corner, I'll be a good guy or a good gal and I'll make no noise and nobody will bother me. No, no. Satan's coming against us all. Satan's coming against us all. We're all uh, are being challenged in this day and time. And, uh, uh, but I believe that God has given us what we need to reign. Paul says to the saints at Ephesus, I won't spend much time in laying a foundation because we talked about it Thursday night. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We said Thursday night that the power must, uh, the, the, the strength, we must draw strength from Jesus. From Jesus, Jesus must be our power source and no one else. Amen. And the power of Christ is sufficient. He gives us more than power. I read to you where the Bible teaches that Christ is exalted far above principalities. Not just above, but far above. Room to spare. Amen. I thank God for that. But we've got to turn to him. And we've got to trust in him. And we've got to lean on him. And we're told in verse 11 to put on the whole armor of God. And in verse 13, take up the whole armor of God. The idea is put it on and never take it off. You, you wear it as a uniform that you never shed. And many times we compare the Roman soldier as Paul writes about this and we show the soldier but and there's nothing wrong with that but according to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 5 and Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 17 the armor is God's armor God is telling the believer that I want you to dress up in what I wear myself the Bible says in Isaiah 11 and 5 and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and the faithfulness, and faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. Isaiah 59 and 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and as a helmet of salvation upon, and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garment of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal and as a cloak. You know, the enemy wants to rob us of our zeal. Amen. Wants to, it's the will of Satan to make the church apathetic. Matter of fact, Jesus predicted that the last epic, the last stage of the church would be that of apathy. 
apathy, laid back. As a matter of fact, the Laodiceans were described as laid back people. One writer said that their invitation was, come on over to Laodicea and join us. And they were just as relaxed as they could be. And uh, Jesus said this about their a state of apathy, he says, and this is describing the last day church. He says, because you say that we are rich, I am rich, and increased with good, and check this out, and have need of nothing. See, when people don't sense that they need anything, they're not zealous to get anything. And, uh, you know, uh, when the, uh, you, you got to be careful that you don't let the devil rob you of your zeal. See, an, a, an apathetic Christian can never win against a Christian who is still hungry. I told him at 8 o'clock what the devil want to do. He wants to rob us, and I, I worded it this way, of the dog in us. So you got to have some dog in you, some desire in you, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna make it in this. Oftentimes, the prize fighter who ends up losing his belt, the champ who gets dethroned, becomes apathetic. See, it's one thing to be out there running in the winter time, getting in shape for your fight, and you don't have any money in the bank. You're talking about something that'll just get you up, you're out there. And uh, you're punching that, uh, that heavy bag and you're doing all of the work because you're hungry. Your family is depending on you. You need to win this fight. That's very different from after you've won a few, now you got three or four hundred million dollars in the bank. You'll ask yourself, why are you out there running? What am I doing this for? almost worth uh, $400 million, all of a sudden that heavy bag can easily get too heavy. And what happens is the man who was broke like you were and who was as hungry as you used to be before you got full, that man will come and take your title because he has more of a reason to fight. He has zeal. You've been lulled into a false sense of security and achievement and all of a sudden you begin to skip stages. I saw one man fight, a fight not too long ago and I told my wife, I said, he's going to lose that fight. Right before the fight, um, he was downstairs, the boxer, you know, most of the time when the fighter gets ready to fight a heavyweight championship match, you're not downstairs in the locker room with your wife. She's sitting on the couch beside you. And you cooling out before the fight. Uh, his opponent was in there getting ready. I told my wife, I said, he's going to lose that fight. She said, how do you know? I said, uh, uh, it, it, he's too relaxed. His zeal is gone. Got his, got his honey down there. That ain't the place for your honey. Send her up into the stand. I'll see you when this is over. Matter of fact, I don't need to see you for the next 14 weeks. I'm going to need all of my strength to beat my opponent because he's doing the same thing. See, some of you who have never uh, been uh, ath athletes and contend uh, contended, you don't understand that. No, no, at a certain time, you know, you got to praise the Lord. Walk away from the pleasures of this life in preparation for what's coming up. Say amen. God gave Egypt seven years of plenty. But God knew, I've got to tell them in the seven years of plenty that there will follow seven years of famine. Because if you get seven years of plenty, it's easy by that third year to feel like this is the way it's going to always be. By the fourth year, you, you, you feel like you are an expert at knowing how to keep plenty. 
Here we are today in our 67th week back into live services. But in week 67, we don't want to not be careful. We don't want to not be smart. Now we know what we're doing, but if you're not careful, you can lose your edge and get messy and get sloppy. God said, tell them that there's seven years of famine coming after the seven years of plenty. Tell them, because they'll think that after five or six years of plenty, that this is the way it's going to be from now on. But it will get just as bad as it was good. And everybody knows that if you don't save in the seven years of plenty, it won't take seven years of famine to deplete you. It'll take maybe about two years. And now you got, now you got, praise the Lord, five more years to go. Sometimes the enemy robs us of our zeal. Gets the church to singing, oh, uh, we, 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 we're toning it down. Preach, Reverend. I hear that all the time. We're toning it down. Now, we, don't, we don't want but so much jubilation. Don't get but so happy. Don't shout but so much. Come on now. We've got to, we've got to learn some sense. That's a trick of Satan. To rob the church of its zeal. And while the churches are cooling off, have you noticed that the world is heating up? The NFL just added a few games to its schedule. The world is becoming increasingly worldly. Raunchy movies are becoming increasingly raunchy. The, the deviant are becoming increasingly deviant. But they're telling the church to tone it down. The devil is a liar. They're inventing new ways to sin every day. But they're telling the born again to tone it down. You don't hear what I'm saying. You know, and, and I'm going to move on. I'm, 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 you don't like this. I can look at you and tell. But, you know, you, you, you could see it coming, mother, that they were going to uh, put us on the non-essential list. Oh, you're back on that again, wouldn't I? I told you. I, 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 I'll be talking about this for a while because you know what? They may try to do it again. I see it coming. I see it. I see it. I see it with these variants and all that. But before the governors declared the church as non-essential, you know who declared the church as non-essential? Pastors. Churches. You remember the trends? The trend was having shorter and shorter churches, church services, quicker and quicker. Brevity in the presence of God became the selling point. Come to our church. Our, our service will be over in 90 minutes. Come to our church. The preacher is not going to preach but 15 minutes. Come to our church. Service starts at 11. You'll be out by 12. Come to our church. Service starts at 11. At the most, you'll be out by, seven, uh, by, by 1230. And people flock to these Churches that the moment you sit down, it's time to get up and leave. But now the baseball game got longer. So the psychologist said that the human attention span is only 15 minutes. Nobody told Hollywood. When was the last time you went to a movie and paid your hard-earned money and bought a bag of popcorn? By the time you get the ticket and the popcorn and the drink, you spent $30 and sat there and watched a 15-minute show. If they Listen, had they pulled that, you would have left there fighting and would have demanded your money back. But when it comes to God, when it comes to the things of God, the trends have been less of thee and more of me. So it stood to reason when they declared that we were non-essential, it stands to reason that we receive, they receive minimal pushback. Churches folded like cheap tents. Some haven't opened yet. Went home with the tail tucked between the legs. 
uh, are driven by fear. When God, when Jesus said that my house shall be called the house of prayer for all men. Churches now and the leading church voices are sending out notices telling their members that you cannot enter into the sanctuary unless you show your vaccination card. Now, where is that in the Bible? So much for whosoever will, let him come. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, so much for come and be healed. And somebody asked the other day concerning vaccines, what would Jesus do? What do you think Jesus do? How do you think Jesus would act in all this? Well, if you go by the biblical evidence, they probably would have called Jesus a rebel. Because according to the historical account, Jesus walked up to the leper and touched him. That, that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Don't get me started. And when he touched him, the leper caught healing. Didn't he do it? So, let me move on. I, f I feel something. I'm going to preach in, 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 in a minute, but I want to I talk to you. See, because we're living in a different time. And the church is standing idly by and we're being uh, redefined. God said, dress up in my outfit. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. We spent time Thursday night on wiles. The Greek word is methodia, the word method. The, the, the orderly and systematically handling of a subject. That is when Satan attacks us, he attacks us after he studies us. Every human being has flaws. Every person has weaknesses. Everybody has desires. Every, every, everybody have kinks in their armor. We all have propensities. We all have peculiarities. We're all just people. Amen. All human beings have idiosyncrasies. Oh, well, Pastor, there's nothing strange about me. Ask the rest of us. I said all, didn't I? I said all. You know, we just, you know, we just don't see our own, but people do. The husband stands and says, I'm a complete man. There's nothing wrong with me. The wife sits beside him and don't say a word. Then when she finally does utter something, she said, mm. He's guilty of thinking more highly of himself than he ought to think. Satan studies us and organizes a plan and then launches his plan. That's called the evil day. That's when he comes after you. After uh, he studied your brother Monet and studied your family. Oh my Study, he studies our appetite. I can't imagine that there are people who don't like chocolate. But there are a few messed up people who don't. And, uh, and, uh, and you know what? Uh, Satan won't come after them with chocolate. Because he knows that they don't like it. I can't imagine a man not liking fried chicken. I really can't imagine that. And yet, especially a brother. And yet, yet, yet. <laughs> I'm having some fun with it. And yet, uh, there are those who don't. So Satan won't come after you uh, if he knows that that's something you don't like. He comes after he studies us and finds out what our preferences are. Our likes and dislikes. And he organizes a plan and he makes a move. And sometimes, if you've ever had that feeling where you feel like life is just working against you and somebody up there is working against you and something's going wrong, you, you're halfway right. It ain't somebody up there. Well, it may be up there it, it, you know, with Satan being the prince of the power of the air, but not in heaven. The devil knows how. So he's really Satan down there. The devil knows how to study you. And then after a while, he launches at an attack. And he comes after you. Sometimes he's saying A, then B. It comes in a series A, B, C, and D. And then sometimes when the series don't fail, don't work, he'll send them all at the same time. 
And then after that attack is over and you've, you've, you've withstood it, the Bible teaches that Satan leaves for a season. He leaves you. He comes right back. And by the time he gets back, he studied you again. This is what Paul says. You need to suit up to be ready to fight against. You ought to shout to somebody and say, suit up. up. And, And he didn't say put on half of it. He said put on the whole armor. The whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not human. But there's a, there's a reason Paul said we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. There's a reason he said that. The first reason is obvious because we don't. But the second reason is less obvious. This is the one that, that, that the discerning and those who are filled with the spirit understand. Even though our battle is not with flesh and blood. When the enemy comes against us, he comes through flesh and blood. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, but flesh and blood, humans are used of Satan to promote the darkness of this world, to promote spiritual wickedness in high places. Humans are in the position to promote these powers and wicked things. So as a believer, you got to know how to look at that person, see the wickedness in them, and then see beyond that and know that it is the devil that you're fighting against. That takes discernment. If you don't know how to see it, you'll end up being racist. You'll end up hating people. You'll end up thinking that everyone is out to get you. You'll end up uh, rejecting folk who look a certain way, talk a certain way, because you don't realize that your enemy is the devil, but Satan uses people. So he says, put on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle uh, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I got a question. With all these, the repetition, the repetitious use of the word against, my question today is, what are we against? Is the modern church now against anything? What are we opposing? What are what what sins do we oppose? Will somebody please tell me? We're certainly not against the abortion industry. Because, you know, even we sanctified people believe in a woman's right to choose. So when against that, we're certainly not against the LBGTQ because we're not judgmental. We're no longer against that. We're certainly not against telling our young black boys and black girl, brothers to turn, pull their pants up and stop being a victim. Amen. Because if you are against that, then you're called a Oreo or an Uncle Tom. My question is, what are we against? What are we against? When racism had its ugly grip on our nation, the white church did not speak, especially in the South, against it as they should have. I don't care if you don't say amen. What are we against? What are we against? We've claimed that God have gotten us out of the correction business. Joel Osteen pastors the largest church uh, in the country, if not where, in our country, and uh, he'll tell you that I'm just called to encourage you. The Lord didn't tell me to do anything but to encourage. That's not, that's not possible. There is no calling 
that limits a preacher to encouraging people only. That, 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 that doesn't exist. See, the Bible teaches, do y'all still believe the Bible? Now, I know you didn't like it. You don't like it that I said something about your precious joy. But the Bible says this, and, and last time I checked, the Bible was right. The Bible says in uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. Now, will somebody find in this passage, I'm just called to encourage you. The word here, notice two words that are side by side, reproof and correction. Reproof is to cause you to be convicted. It is to convict you to the point of shaming you. It is to convict you to the point of making you angry, to bring about correction. Now, when did the church get out of the correction business? We're not called to be movie stars. We're not called to be the celebrities. Y'all don't like me. We're not called to uh, learn how to uh, cohabitate with sin, to find middle ground with sin. That's not what we're called for. We're called to be against these things, against them. And you may not want to be against anything, but God sent me to tell you whether you want to be against them or not, the devil is against you. And don't you ever forget it. Don't you ever forget it. You have an enemy out there that is doing everything he can to see to it that you not put on the whole arm of God. To see to it that you not stand up and resist and hold out and hold your ground, praise God, when the evil day comes. It is the will of Satan for you to fall. So if you're not against him, then it's a one-way fight because he's certainly against you. And I want you to know that uh, God have called us, praise the Lord, to fight. We're not called to accommodate sin. We're called to oppose sin. It's not a compliment to you that uh, when the world calls you and says, well, you don't judge you don't do anything, you're just sweet. That's not a compliment to a Christian. That means you're not bringing any correction. There was a time when the world saw saints coming. They could be cussing and they'd stop cussing because a saint walked up. They could be smoking. Man put the cigarette in his pocket because Rev just walked up. They'd be drinking, they hide the liquor because the preacher just walked up. Now the world see you coming up, they offer you a smoke. Hey man, you want, want a drag? Hey, Doc, you want to hit? Why? Because we don't correct. We don't correct. Instead of standing uh, in opposition, we are learning to just get along. Why can't we all just get along? Now, Rodney King asked that. He was not a preacher. He was not uh, uh, an apostle. He was not an anointed man. There's a reason why we can't get along. Paul said, what fellowship? have righteousness with unrighteousness. Well, amen. What concord have he who is a believer with an infidel? Where does light and darkness get along? See, that's, a, that's an answer to that question. Sometimes the reason we can't get along is because you don't want to do right. And you don't want to do right and you want to, you want to pull me into your sin. That's why we can't get along. And God didn't call us to get along. God called us to stand against. And I want to say to the preachers who are watching, and a lot of you do, that you better, you better stand on your calling because Satan is putting a plan together right now to try to put you out of business. And you ought to purpose in your heart that you're not going to allow the enemy to do that to you. 
but instead you're going to stand and put on the whole armor of God and stand against these wicked powers that exist. And I heard him say, for we uh, wrestle not against human beings, but we stand against principalities. These principalities are ruling devils. They rule over territories. You know, you find a lot of these principality demons in the world of government. Oh, Lord, look at what the government is doing to us now. Did you ever believe that you live in America? In an America where they're trying to make people take shots that they don't want to take. Now, even though it's against the law, the Nor Nuremberg Codes of 1947 said that they're not supposed to be able to coerce people to take any medical treatment that they don't want. And look at you now, they're saying if you don't do it, we're going to fire you. Whether you've taken the shot or not, that's your business. And that's not my point. But my point is you ought not to be able to walk up to me, a perfectly healthy human being, praise the Lord, and tell me that I've got to put something in my body. And I don't know where the women are who used to get mad, bring up abortion. And the first thing she'll tell you is my body, my choice. Now them same people are telling us that we've got to put stuff in our bodies. Good God Almighty, and, and many of those, if not all of them, are made with the byproduct of aborted babies. And when you get good and sanctified, you don't want that in you. Y'all not saying amen. And uh, they're, they're, they're trying to force you to do it. And they're putting pressure on the saints. Now, unless you uh, have been paying attention to this church, you didn't see it coming. But the reason I say if you paid attention here is that I told you months ago that the day they said we're going to make uh, vaccinations available to all Americans who want them, I said then soon they're going to drop that all Americans who want them and they're going to try to make everybody do it. And I, whether you do it or not, that's your business. But they ought not to be able to make people. This is the, the work of principalities. We see principalities declaring that a man can turn himself into a woman. And once that man says he's a woman, now these principalities and demons are trying to tell the rest of us that if you slip up, then the, man been, the man's name has been Mike all your life. You've been working with Mike on the job for 20 years. You went out with Mike. You went to went to church with Mike. You went to the bar with Mike. You watched the game with Mike. And Mike de decided that Mike was going to become Makayla. And if you now slip up and call Makayla Mike, they'll try to st uh, fire you and discipline you. This is the work of evil spirits. It's the work of the enemy in the world. And, and, and when you see all this stuff going on, God knows you can't take it unless you're suited up. Unless you already have on the whole armor of God. Because without the armor, you won't be able to resist. Without the armor, you'll find yourself constantly giving ground, giving up. See, that's the context there. Keep your territory. Hold your ground. Soldiers don't retreat. Good soldiers don't retreat unless their commanding officer tells them to retreat. But if their commanding officer don't tell them to retreat, then they stay where they are. But look at what the devil is doing. We're constantly retreating. We're giving ground. 
We're making excuses. We're becoming something else. But God says, I want to give you power to stand your ground. I want to give you strength to be able to stand up against the wiles of the devil, against these principalities, against these powers, demon spirits that have been given permission and authority. They've been given might. They've been given the right from the devil to come against you. If they come in human and inhuman forms. So you got your principalities, you got your powers, and look at this thing here. Principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. This is a dark world. There are people in place who rule the witchcraft. They rule the pornography. Yes, they do. They mess up children. These uh, traffickers. It's the darkness of this world. The drug trade. They said the other day uh, that uh, I think it was the Pfizer vaccine. They gave it uh, FDA approval. FDA approval. FDA approval. They call the FDA the gold standard. FDA approval. I might be wrong about this, but then those opioids have FDA approval. And look at all the people that got killed. Look at all the lives that got messed up with FDA approval. Look at all the drug addicts that they created with FDA approval. You better be sure that your ankle holds you better know that you've been suited up because the, the devil is a liar. He's coming against the saints. He doesn't, he don't care about the little man. Don't care about the little woman. But aren't you glad today to know that Jesus loves you and Jesus has given you power and given you a way to keep from losing your mind to keep from cracking. The Lord told me to tell you that it's time to be strong. Be strong in the Lord and stand your ground against the rulers of the darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, wicked folk who promote all kinds of sin and maliciousness persons who are not they're not just evil themselves but they don't have problems expressing their evil they plot evil they are plotting evil against the church even as I speak the Lord's showing me how the world is trying to surround the church but I'm so glad that despite their best efforts, we win. All you got to do is hold to his hand, stand your ground, and live holy because God has anointed us to be able to stand up against the wiles of the devil. Somebody declare today, I'm not gonna lose my mind. Somebody shout today, I'm not going to crack. I'm not going to fold. I'm not going to be de depressed. I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm going to outlast this attack because God has put fight in me. God has put dog in me. The Lord has put something in me that gives me what I need. To keep on keeping on. I want to fight the right fight the right way. Let me close. But I heard somebody say, you don't know what I've been through. If you knew what I've been through, you would understand my praise. If you knew what I've suffered, you'd understand my praise. You would understand that I have a right to praise the Lord. The Holy Ghost 
began to move on me. And the Holy Ghost said, Patrick, reverse that thing. Tell him your right to praise me is not based on what you've been through, but your right to praise me is based on what Jesus went through on your behalf. He died. He was crucified. He was beaten. He was lied on. He was spit on. Good God Almighty. They kicked him. They stabbed him. They lied on him. He hung his head and he died. But Allah. Somebody shout Allah. Allah. That Sunday morning, he rose again. And he's the reason that we have a right to praise the Lord. He's the reason that we have to give God the praise. Will I, will somebody praise the Lord for saving you? Will somebody praise the Lord for setting you free? Let me hear you praise him, not for what you've been through, but what he went through on our behalf. Yeah! Yes! Yeah. Since you've done all this for me, I think I'll throw my hands up. Since you've done all this for me, I think I lift my voice. Since you've done all this for me, oh, Lord, oh, Jesus, I think I'll tell the world that you're the only Savior, that you're real that you're powerful and that you're soon to come again. How many know that Jesus Christ is coming back? Jesus Christ is gonna snatch us out in the nick of time. So friends of mine, let us fight the right fight, the right way. Let us pray in the Holy Ghost. Let us put on the whole arm of God. Let us make sure our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is, I'm ready to march. I'm ready to climb. I'm ready to run. Whatever. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Let me hear you praise him if you're ready. Whatever the cost, whatever the fight, oh Lord, I'm ready. I've been prepared and I've got the shield of faith. Let me close here. But that faith leads me to believe that whatever comes my way, God will see me through. Whatever, whatever comes our way, he's still a healer, he's still a deliverer, he's still a way maker. Do you still believe that he's able, that he's able? Oh Lord, I feel my help coming here. He's able to see you through. He's able to set your soul on fire. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, Lord. Woo! Your 
Don't just look at somebody and say, suit up. Put on. Put on. Put on the whole armor of God. You can't fight without the armor. Mm -hmm. I read, but just for a spell, some soldiers uh, didn't like the armor because the armor was heavy. The helmet was heavy. The breastplate uh, was restricting. And they felt that they could be more nimble and that they could fight better without the armor. So they were allowed by their commanding officer to go out without the armor. They all but got slaughtered without the armor. See, I know, I know in this day of easy believism, I know in this day of where they call holiness bondage, I know as we talk about things that can be restricting, I know that they call it old fogey. I know that they call us playing church. Oh, I know all the stuff that they're saying. But wait until the enemy comes against them. They're going to do what they've done everywhere else they've been. Fool. Right. Fool. You know why? Because they have no armor. They have no armor. The armor might be heavy, but you can't. But let me tell you something. When you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. You're a real one. He's been behind enemy lines. All that you have to wear into battle is quite heavy. But it, it helps you come back. See? See, yes, it's, it's heavy sometimes. Uh, what the church put on you. You can't go here. You can't go there. You can't do this. And you can't do that. And sanctification means you got to come out of this group. And sanctification means you can't do no ski wee. Sanctification means you got to be real. Now, now, sanctification means you can't be a sissy, can't be a homosexual, can't be a homemonger. Oh, oh! It means all that stuff. And, and, and you know what? That gets heavy. But I'll tell you why. It may be heavy. But when the devil come against you, you will be glad that you have your armor. Woo! Somebody lift their hands and praise the Lord. Somebody ought to say, I'm so glad for my armor. I, 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 didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't like some of those restrictions pastor put on me. Some of those mothers got on my nerve. Some of those others, yeah, they, they, I'm a young man, but looking back on my life, without that armor, I wouldn't be here today. Wouldn't have lasted. Ah, 44 years and counting. Armor. 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 Gives you power to go through something. Armor give you the strength to fight the right battles, the right way. See, those who are fighting against the armor, they're fighting the wrong battle. How are you going to be a church preaching against a church that preach church stuff? See, how are you going to be a church and you, 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 you're busy trying to make sure your church don't sound like a church, that you don't look like you're going to church? There's nothing churchy about your church. You're, you're fighting, but you're fighting the wrong battle. And you're fighting the wrong way. The test of the church, I want to go on record. P.L. Wooden, the test of the church is not how far it can stray from its old landmark. The test of the church is how close 
you can remain where you were when God called you in the first place. How many can still say, I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost feel, and I'm fire, ah, fire, baptized. Ooh. Jesus died so that we could be sanctified. He didn't die for us to move away from it. There was two things, and they have to be understood. I'm going to pray. We're going home. I want to celebrate my mother, so I'm going to get to that right after service. Uh, two things. So you got to know the difference between imputed righteousness and practical righteousness. This is what these guys miss it. See, these lightweights. These lightweights don't understand the difference. Imputed righteousness is the righteousness that you gain the day you get saved. God confers righteousness upon you. Now, you haven't changed a thing yet. If, if, you, were, if you were drinking before you came and got saved, the liquor bottle still in the car. See? Because that's where he left it before he came to the church. All right? The, the, the drugs, it's still, I'm just using it, still in the glove compartment. But the Lord has imputed righteousness on it. The easy believism churches, and these guys that don't understand, stops right there. That's where we're wrong. That's where they go wrong. Paul teaches after we've been imputed with righteousness. See, this is how the book of Ephesians is divided. The first part deals with imputed righteousness. Righteousness that God declared before the foundation of the world. But if you keep reading in chapter 4, he begins to talk about what you got to come out of, what you got to give up, take off the old, put on the new. That's called practical righteousness. Practical righteousness. See, you begin to walk in practical righteousness because you have imputed righteousness. Now, I'm going to, Brother Haynes, if you're watching, I'm going to put your wife on the spot. I thank God for you. You look so nice. You look like a first lady. You got, you got the look. Now, you got the... Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to, I don't want you to think anything deep because it's not a tr trick question. Why are you standing there uh, with that dress on? Because I bought it. Well, he bought it. Okay. What's the next reason? <laughs> and I liked it. And the next one? <laughs> I wanted to wear it. One more. I'm a woman. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, she said, and she's right. She said, I didn't figure I had to say that one. She's right. But. That's why. Nobody thinks it's strange. Because you know what? When she came here, God decided before she got here that she'd be female. So with her being female, she puts that on because she's a female. Well, when the Lord uh, declares you righteous, then you begin to walk in practical righteousness because he have declared you righteous. Ruffin, you just came in and married this girl. You're her husband. You got to treat her right. You got to prefer her before you. You got to be her protector. If she needs you to work five jobs to take care of the family, do it and smile. Six. That's what men do. But you know why? Because you're the husband. And once you take on that role, and you and it's imputed, you're it. Now you know what you have to do. Once you become it, you have to act like it. Somebody shout, Amen.
Somebody shout amen. Oh, Lord. There's a certain way you do because of who you are. I'm done. I want to read one verse. I, I, I quoted the other day. It's been hanging around my spirit. And, and John, you and Anthony, uh, Elder uh, Amachuku, you and Elder Woodson, y'all probably could do more with it than me. But it's been hanging around me. Um, in chap Proverbs, Proverbs, <laughs> Proverbs chapter 17. And, it, you know, and it's a simple look at it says in verse 7 it says Ex excellent speech becometh not a fool much less do lying lips a prince nobody is expecting a fool to talk like he's got good sense because he's a fool but people are surprised when rulers and princes and people of note are liars because you expect a person that once they've right. attained certain status to have certain character and integrity, right? All right, we're saved. God have made us righteous. Then it is expected that we walk out and live out that which the Lord have declared us to be. In the name of Jesus. Hence the whole armor of God. Because Satan is determined that you are not going to live out what you have what has been imputed upon you. If I couldn't stop the imputation, if I couldn't stop you from getting to the altar, I did my best to keep you from getting saved. And you went up there and got saved anyway. But if I can't stop, I couldn't stop that. But what I will do is I'll come against you in the evil day and keep you from being in a practical way what God just imputed upon you. God says, that's all right, I have a remedy. Put on the whole armor of God. Amen. And the armor will do the trick. I'm stopping right here. My time is up. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for everybody who wants to fight the right battle, the right way, who wants to uh, walk, first of all, prepare. See, you, some, some things you can't do without preparation. What happens is um, real life shows when a person is actually prepared. You can claim to be prepared all you want to. But everybody knows that if you get out there and you crash and burn, everybody says they wasn't ready. Looked ready, talked ready, and thought they were ready, but wasn't ready. The ready, the prepared, we're prepared to march, run, climb, and do what it takes. God wants to prepare you. God wants to prepare you. The song says, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, I pray for the believers. I pray for everyone here today, everyone here today who is interested in living out practically what you have imputed upon us spiritually. I pray, oh God, the Holy Ghost is in here, for every believer who are saying, Lord, I want to fight the right battles, the right way. I've wasted so much time fighting the ones who are trying to help me. I've wasted so much time pushing against, kicking against the prick. You've given me a pastor. You've given me a church. You've given me people. And I resisted you. I've, I've, I've wasted so much time with the attack of the enemy during the evil day. Lord, I don't, I don't want to waste another moment in the name of Jesus. So Father, I ask you now to bless me, to suit up, 
to put on your outfit, the whole armor of God in the name of Jesus. From the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, dress me, Lord, in your uniform. Dress me for battle. Dress me, O oh Lord, that I might be able to win. In Jesus' name, I pray healing. I pray deliverance. I pray freedom in Christ. In the name of Jesus. And it is so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord praises. Glory to God.